Hey gang, I want to talk with you a little bit today about uh, some of the things that we hear uh, out on the street and that's, you know, hey, uh, you, should, you should train with somebody that was in the military or somebody that was in law enforcement because of that particular experience. Of course, uh, Brandon and I have our, our Marine Corps experience respectively. Um, but not for nothing, and, and Brendan, I, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but uh, I really don't think that anyone should train with us simply on the fact that we are Marines. Right, no. I think there, there's context to everything, right? Yeah. Uh, there will be, there will come a time in your training where you do have to approach those guys, but definitely not on the 90%. Right, ninety percent of the train probably not. Right, and and the thing is, is that, I mean, while military experience does give you a a unique experience that you can then bring to the table, so to speak, to the regular civilian market, there there is some uh, validity there. Um, but let's just be sober about this. In the regular uh, military, and I'm not talking about anything special forces or anything like that. I'm talking about your, your plain Jane, regular uh, uh, run of the mill military. That could be Army infantry, Marine Corps infantry, or whatever other combat arms. The, that training is tailored for what we call the lowest common denominator. And what that means is, is that we have to take Everybody, and that could be, be in the whole group of everybody, that could be a person that's really, really proficient, really, really good, your studs, if you will. God, what's your sole purpose in this army? To do whatever you tell me, drill sergeant. Damn it, Gump. You're a damn genius. That's the most outstanding answer I've ever heard. You must have a damn IQ of 160. You are damn gifted, Private Gump. And then we have Carl, right? That guy who rode the short bus on his way to school every morning. Right. You, you know why your weapon's not shooting. Why would it not be shooting, Private? Maybe because you have run out of ammo. Maybe because you have finished all of the rounds inside your magazine. How? So now you can no longer shoot Ow. because you have no more ammo. <laughs> wow, did this happen? Just sorry. You shot it all, Private! Oh. Private, your weapon is clear at this time. Oh. Step back to the rear. Okay. Didn't tell the recruiter, though. But. Didn't tell the recruiter, but the recruiter knew, by the way. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> that guy has to pass the same standard and qualification as everybody else. So the standard is, is pretty what we call LCD, lowest common denominator. Right, so when, when somebody says, hey, I was you know, in the military this, and they were whatever combat arms, basic combat arms, and even myself, I was an infantry officer when I was in the, uh, the Marine Corps. Basic combat arms, nothing crazy or attractive. Uh, but the, the level of training you get there is based on, again, that lowest common denominator. What do you say about that, Brendan? Well, yeah, it's true, because um, it's, it's a spectrum. I hate to say this, but it's a spectrum. We're going to use that word? Yeah, it's a spectrum, right? So you've got <laughs> uh, guys that barely pass qualification and then guys that are uh, studs, according to Ernie. Yep. But from the eyes of the commander, right, in the field, they're all the same person. Right, right? they're and all that, trained. Right, it's not like you can be like, oh, this guy's better than this guy. No. The problem, though, is when you get out of the military, nobody will ever admit that they're the lowest common denominator. They okay. are, Carl. Right, and so the, the problem then becomes is that, um, let's say you give us 10 military instructors, right? A majority of them are probably going to be good, okay? Six, seven, uh, probably going to be good, but you never know who you're meeting because it's not like you can identify those six and seven good instructors from the three bad instructors without taking the class first. Right. Because all of them are just going to say, I was in the military. And everything has to be taken into context, right? Like if you, for example, uh, you're, you're a cook, okay? Um, a cook could have been uh, generally a good instructor in the military because there's PMIs, right? Uh, you could be a professional, <laughs> professional marksmanship instructor. You could have been, I actually know of a cook. We do know somebody that's like that. Yep. Um, that works at a range that we go to. She was a cook and she became a PMI and she is a good shooter and she does train a lot. Uh, but the problem that you run into is that you don't know, right? A lot of the people will not share with you the accuracy of their history. 
And, and then that's, that's a great point, but there's another layer to this. You could be Joe Stud and be able to perform, shoot, and all the things, but there's another level to teaching, and that's actually the teaching part. Right. Just because you have the skill does it, doesn't necessarily mean that you can effectively convey those skills to another person right. in a teaching type manner. Okay. So you might be able to shoot really well, but that might not be your forte. And, and the thing is, by and large, we have some great people in the military that you point them in the right direction and they're going to effectively mow down whatever is in their way very, very well. But you put them in front of another person and the interpersonal skills, you know, they're not that, you know, great. Right, that's why you're, you're in a fire team, right? And usually, and what would usually would happen is that you have a fire team leader and you got three dudes under that guy and whoever takes over the fire team should be, in theory, the guy most senior below the fire team leader. But it doesn't have a well, fire team leader taking over, right? But it doesn't happen that way in that small unit because the leadership traits will come out and your ability to instruct is part of that leadership trait. Communicate. Right? right. And so what ends up happening is that if you are, yeah, sure, you could be senior and you could be good with your, whatever you're doing. Right. But if you're unable to evolve and be able to instruct, communicate, and shoot, move, right, um, then you don't become the next fire team leader because they do choose that, right? Just because mm -hmm. you're a senior does not necessarily mean you get promoted right away. And so that alone is evidence, right? that somebody could be, and it's true, Some there's a lot of Navy SEALs, there's a lot of Marines, there's a lot of Rangers out there that are able to do the things that they did, but they cannot teach because communication skills lacking, right? Um, sure, yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, the, and then, so we've talked a little bit about the uh, the military, um, and I think the, the other part of the coin in here is, okay, there is some level of training. I think the, the, the good thing about the military is is that you, certainly get the training of being able to perform under stress, for sure. I think hands down in the military environment, uh, Army Marines, Army Marines, uh, you get the, the instruction and the experience of being able to operate under a great degree of stress and perform well uh, in that setting. Right. And I think that that is certainly transferable to the, uh, to the civilian market. I think the, uh, the ability to uh, succinctly and concisely execute whatever uh, is also learned uh, in the military. A lot of discipline is learned in the military. Being able to um, practice and do the things that you don't really like to do, you do it because you uh, need to, right. is, is also a skill or a habit that you develop likely from the, uh, from the military. So there's a lot of great things as well right. coming out of there. But uh, as it relates to your experience, the majority of your skill set that you currently have, right? Was that attained in the Marine Corps or post the Marine Corps? Um, yeah, hit and miss, right? So, I would say probably majority, sixty percent up post Marine Corps, and forty percent in the Marine Corps. And here's the truth to this: so I was a combat engineer. I looked for IEDs for a living back then, and a lot. And I kid you not, a lot of that situational awareness has translated really great towards the civilian market, right? Um, being able to relate to people, um, being able to tell people, you know, something's off in their baseline and whatnot. I talk about it all the time on CCW classes. Rifle marksmanship too, I take a lot from the um, military, right? Because I was in an IED hunting unit, I was fortunate enough to be able to take extra classes and being given extra training beyond what a regular combat engineer or a regular grunt would be. But pistol marksmanship, Marine Corps, crash <laughs> uh, at least the time when i was in we were using berettas and it was ridiculously easy to shoot um i heard it's a little harder now and even the marine corps rifle calls harder now too but right. um, majority of my skill did translate to a certain degree um obviously trying to identify components of an ied is illegal to share to the regular civilian so i guess i can't teach that um but the majority of my teaching skill didn't happen in the Marine Corps. Now I say majority because there was a lot of teaching in the Marine Corps too. I became different style. Different of style, right? So I became a training officer at some point in between 2018 and 2020, and I started coordinating rock clearing school rollovers, dunker, which you you know you got to swim out and all that stuff. But it's a different style of teaching, and then that's when post Marine Corps. That's where I learned a lot of my pistol shooting, which is, that's why it's 60% because it's majority of what we do. A lot of my pistol shooting, and then at the same time, 
a lot more advanced rifle shooting. And then also I learned a lot more about how to teach people and how to communicate with people. And so I think that's the, the bridge and the disconnect that, that there is there, right? There's a lot of things that I take from that experience, but I didn't solely rely on that in order for me to get employment. Right. So, right. Um, but there's an opposite end to this though, right? Because civilian instructors can't get away too, right? Oh no. Right, because the, here's the thing, okay? 90% of your training, shooting, shooting. Yes. Okay. But there is that top 10% of your shooting career, though, that you reach that, dude, you have to consult somebody that had experience in doing the things that they're doing, right? And even if you do that, there's that one top percent. I'm, I'm going to do a shout out here, if that's okay. Um, Ed's Manifesto, right? If you look up Ed's Manifesto, he was a Mexican um, SWAT guy in TJ. Um, he did a lot of undercover work. If you're at a point in your training where you're now training anti-kidnapping, like you're being kidnapped and you're trying to escape, go to that guy, right? He, he, there's no way, there's no amount of book reading and classes you can take that he will be able to teach you, right. you know? Um, so you're going to the source is what you're source, saying. Source, yeah. Right. And then you can even go talk about, let's say talk about team movements, right? Team tactics, um, stresses of real life combat and, you know, getting into force and force. Like, if you yourself as the instructor have not experienced real force-on-force -force training, then you're doing a disservice to the people that you're teaching. Right. Because so, if you're teaching force-on-force -force and never experienced force-on-force... -force, right. Well... <laughs> uh, you know, so there, there's, there's a limit to it, right? But I, like I said, 90% of your journey, I may, even maybe 95% of your shooting journey, right? You could probably get away with just anybody, right? Why don't I say anybody? Um, I, I think anybody, regardless of military, military not military experience... Yeah can can really get good at shooting and teaching and so on uh but uh, what brendan is saying is that the last say five percent or ten percent in this case um there has to be uh some tie-in with experience to make everything more relevant right yeah like well, here's a good example it doesn't have to be military it could mm. be competition right could you're be. at the top five percent right you're like you have gone through everything you've done to and now you're looking for to somebody to teach you how to be a comp shooter. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna go to a guy that went to the military and never did comps, right? You're gonna go to a guy that did competition shooting. Right. Nor are you gonna go to a competition shooter to teach you force and force training, right? Right. So there is there is a value in being a military veteran, security guard, a police officer, or even a competition shooter, but majority of the time, you don't need those backgrounds in order for you to be good at being able to teach somebody to shoot. Right, well, uh, there's two aspects of this. There's performance and then there's teaching, okay? And, and both don't require any military or whatever experience, uh, but on the performance side, one must be disciplined to continue to practice and hone said skill. The teaching side, that is the art of it all because the science is the performance. Right. The art is the skill of being able to communicate effectively, deliver a message in a way that the student understands because not every student learns the same, not every student has the same experiences. It is, it is important for the instructor to understand their audience and tailor the message so that way that student can receive it effectively. And that right there is not something that is taught in any book. That is, is time and experience of teaching. So I am gonna say one thing though. So whether you're a cop, you're, you're an armed security guard, because if you're unarmed then you don't relate to this video. In the event that you approach an assailant, here's what I want you to do. You're gonna pull up, left hip forward, placing your right hand on your away hip thusly, giving the illusion that you have a gun, which of course we both know you don't, okay? But you know what we do have? Our voices! We have our voices. You remember one thing from today, it's this. That the mind is the only weapon that doesn't need a holster. Right. And <laughs> go observe and report over there. Um, so you got <laughs> cops, and then you got uh, armed security guards, whether it be, you know, EP um, or uh, whatever. And then you got your competition shooters and military. Regardless of where you're at in this spectrum right here of experience, what you need to take is you need to take a class that teaches you how to teach. And that's why I'm going to throw one out there. The USCCA instructor program is good, right? You got to get a good instructor though, right? Vet that too, because even that needs to get vetting, right? Look at the reviews in their classes. Make sure nobody's just rubber stamping stuff in there. Not saying that they are, 
But you know, but you're also not saying that they're not. But I can I cannot say that nobody's not because I haven't seen everybody. So vet those instructors too. But here's what I'm saying: the USCCA curriculum taught properly is really good in teaching you how to teach in the civilian market. Mm -hmm. And so that's I actually draw a lot from that when I'm teaching civilians, right? So if you combine your experience and you do that, I think you'd be good. Huh? Yep. So there you have it. Just because you're in the military doesn't make you the grand wizard of teaching. And just because you don't have military law enforcement experience doesn't mean that you can't be just as good. So think about that as you look at who to train with. Okay, think about that if that's something that you want to do as being an instructor. There's really nothing holding you back but yourself. If you think all gun laws are an infringement and you live behind the enemy lines in the People's Republic of California, then check out our Unconvicted Felons uh, t-shirt. Uh, we came out with this t-shirt design for you where uh, most of us are fed up with the, uh, the situation here in, the, in California. So check it out, check out our website, awesome t-shirt coming at you, and our new line of two arms uh, where it stands for two A rights matter. So check out our new t-shirt and help us feed our dog.